On my right is the uh, internationally known children's author, although I think just think of him as an author, in fact, T.A. Barron, uh, who has produced over 20 highly acclaimed novels, including the well-known Merlin Saga series, and is the winner of the 2011 de Grommet USN Medallion for a lifetime contribution to the field of children's and young adult literature, which could not be uh, more uh, heartily deserved. Uh, he's also been the most gracious and warm correspondent, and we've already begun to swap stories about hiking in various different parts of the world, so it's a great pleasure to have him here. Thank you, Dan, for that gracious introduction, and thank you all for coming. I'll begin with a a brief comment about Jonathan Bates' introductory lecture, which I thought was marvelous, and both both uh, in depth and breadth. But um, I want to call upon one line from uh, those lines written above Tintern Abbey by Wordsworth and quoted and, and, and discussed so thoughtfully. Uh, and that is that, that line uh, where Wordsworth says, this disturbs me with joy. Now, if you, and if you think about that sentence, I think there's so much in there. The, uh, first of all, of course, the word joy, and it, it evokes um, the power that nature has for us all to um, both uh, the, to be evocative of our senses, but also to be a healing environment, and, and to go deeper than that, a place of real inspiration. And, and yet it's paired with the word dis- disturbs. And, and that's, I think that's part of its brilliance, because uh, nature, too, can be um, um, quite unsettling. And it's, it's not merely how disturbed and painful it can be if, if lost, if a treasured aspect or element or species or place that we know and love is, is destroyed, paved over, lost in some way, or deeply compromised. It's also, it's also that, it's, uh, that the very beauty of it is disturbing at a certain level. There's a poignance to it uh, that, that is reflective of our brevity as, as creatures and our mortality. And in some way, also, a, uh, an invitation to something larger that we can't quite know but could possibly uh, experience. And, and that really gets the heart for me about, I think, why I'm a, I'm a, a scribe who uh, evokes ecological themes in my writing, is because it is through nature that for someone like me, and I suspect every one of you in this room, that I, I, I have a sense of being both very, very small and at the same time, very, very large. Um, that that in, in natural environments, it doesn't have to be the grand Rocky Mountain uh, uh, vistas of mountain peaks or starry skies where I happen to live in Colorado, USA. It could be a very intimate connection with one particular elm tree, um, as used to be out on Port Meadow when I was here as a student way back when. Some of you might remember those elegant trees which unfortunately are no longer there, they're like holes in the sky to me when I walk in that place. But the, um, the sense of both being humbled by the grandeur and vastness of nature, while at the same exact time being enlarged by connection with all of that. That's, that's, the, that's the duality that nature evokes, in a, and, and no, nowhere else, nothing else. Um, uh, this is... <clears throat> This is uh, why some of us, myself included, are accused uh, by some in organized religion of being nature worshipers, which I confess is true. Um, but that's why it's frightening, I think, in part to uh, some in organized religion, certainly not all, because there is great enduring power, and that's, of course, uh, tracks back to the Gaia myth that, that Jonathan quoted. So let me just, uh, in my brief remarks here, let me just tell, I'm going to make three quick points and then turn it over to my colleague and all of you. Um, <clears throat> there, I'm just going to quickly say a word about metaphor, about sacredness, and about the challenge that we face in using language 
to evoke uh, the precarious fragility and beauty and inspiration of nature and the human condition and how they interact. Um, as to metaphor, we all have so many wonderful examples in our minds and in our lives, but I'm just going to pick one which actually came out of uh, a brief conversation before we started. I was reminded of a passage in the science writing of, of someone who was by training a paleontologist, but in fact was a poet. His name was Lauren Isley. <clears throat> and I don't, I don't know if any of you have encountered his writing, but he would do things like, one quick example, when uh, walking in the hills of Montana, which are very rumpled and dry uh, terrain, but very, very crosscut by, by um, dried gullies. And uh, he, 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 he was looking, I think, for the fossils of saber-toothed tigers at the time. And, and he said he likened the landscape to the folds of a huge exposed brain. And, and the fossils he was seeking were the remnants of forgotten thoughts. Now, isn't that a lovely use of language to evoke something much larger than that place and the ideas? Um, just one example. Now, at the same time, we can also use language to evoke uh, the dangers of environmental insanity and, and, um, and, and pollution and destruction in its various forms. Uh, you could say, you could, in fact, um, I'll just pick one quick one out of the air. You could say that um, <clears throat> carbon wasteful behavior is, is, is akin to being, as a species, humanity, being like an addicted smoker. Uh, there are only three possible outcomes. One is that we will fall over dead uh, sooner than we would like. Uh, one is that we will continue to live, but in a much diminished capacity. And, and, and a third is uh, that we will somehow kick the habit and breathe the fresh air again. <laughs> and, and, and so those are our choices, really. And, and again, in a metaphorical sense, but language evokes that perhaps even better than reams of, of scientific treatises, which we need also. But it's the humanities that give us not just uh, the knowledge, but the context of how to express our, our, the important uh, values and issues and, and contradictions and trade-offs and subtleties of living sustainably in this, on this planet, on this wonderful beloved but beleaguered planet of ours. So uh, that's, that's just a thought about metaphor. Now, uh, a quick word about <coughs> the role of language writing and evoking the valuable and even perhaps the sacred in nature. Um, I, 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 I think, I think the best way to get at this, honestly, is by a single word, mist, which uh, for the Druids was evocative of that place that was in between. Um, um, that, that substance mist is neither quite air nor quite water, but something else, something in between. And it is in that in-betweenness that um, one can find an invitation to wonder or awe or indeed the sacred. And it's that inexplicable and yet still potentially describable in part that we seek, we long for, but cannot quite understand or embrace that nature can evoke in us all. Um, and I, and I, I think the word mist um, connotes that. A, a, a larger example, honestly, that, that um, um, is from a different religious tradition um, in the Old Testament, that wonderful story of Noah's Ark, um, which is often told as a story, uh, a, a, a parable about faith, which of course it is. But it's also, I think, um, if you think about it, it's an environmental parable. Um, because after all, simply put, God uh, implored Noah to go through an awful lot of trouble uh, 
to save two of every kind of creatures. And, and just as you think about it, if God wanted Noah to go through all that trouble, how can we do anything less? Really. So now, um, now let me just let me just wind up by a thought about the challenge here. You know, I, I sometimes one of the one of the things that I learned about a kid from a rough-hewn colonial that I was from Colorado when I first arrived here in the '70s, and I, I learned about when I came here was um, Aeolian harps. Do you know about them, Ben? Um, a kind of um, musical instrument, but much more that, that the Romantic poets would would have in, on their windowsill or in the garden. And I had never heard of it, but when I found them, in the, you know, walking around in Wales or Scotland or or Ireland and England, I was so moved by the by the presence, but also the metaphor of um, this idea that that the that the purpose of this harp was not to be plucked by human hands, but instead to be blown and therefore plucked by the winds. And, and, and I'm, I can only guess that the Romantic poets would have them um, as a reminder that the, the work of those of us who, who uh, um, wander in the pathways of story and language is, is in some ways to assemble words in such a way that they might might vibrate in the winds of human experience and, and make music in our hearts. So the challenge here, I think we face, and we all know this, is, is um, and it's not just for literature, by the way, it's for all of, all of the arts. Um, the challenge, I think, is, is in this data-driven, short attention span, empirical world that we live in to keep alive room for wonder, mystery, the sacred that nature evokes. And quite counter to the idea that wonder is in fact uh, a distraction uh, that, that, that <coughs> some people have written about. I think that wonder is a crucial doorway that, that uh, nature can evoke and that we can walk through to perhaps a larger understanding of both ourselves and the natural world around us. Thank you.